the challenge of a permaculture design course is we want to tell you everything day one. <laughs> like you just want to like open like a fire hose. Um, and so it's been helpful having a bigger team to know like, no, someone else is going to cover that. So what we do want to do is just give you all a common foundation as a starting point this morning. So what we want to do in this hour is just touch on how do you define permaculture? You know, the question when you get home at the end of the weekend, well, what were you doing all weekend? I was doing, well, it's permaculture. So we want to touch on that, and that's something we're all practicing. It's like a lifelong practice. A little bit about where it came from and why. Chris will do more of the why tomorrow, so I won't really go too much into that, actually. Um, and then really focus on the ethics and the principles. There are three core ethics and a series of principles, depending on whose school you follow, um, the Bill Mollison and the Dave Holmgren um, principles. And so here's one way of defining permaculture, um, that it's really more of a philosophy of, of working with natural system, which is not something we do a lot of um, in the common culture that there's an emphasis on protracted and thoughtful observation. Um, permaculture places a great emphasis. It's the first principle we'll talk about, is observe and interact. And that we're looking at all elements of the landscape or the ecosystem, all the plants and animals, um, for all the functions that they serve. And it takes some observation sometimes to understand the functions that are being, that are being met. Um, rather than looking at them as single products in the system. And to touch on that, um, just briefly, this is a definition that comes from Bill Mollison, um, one of the originators of permaculture. Then thinking about plants and animals for all their functions, um, one group of plants we have a tendency to like siege war on would be those that are invasive, invasive mm -hmm. plants. And um, Josh has arranged for um, a woman that just wrote a book on invasive plants, the war on invasive plants, um, from a permaculture perspective. She's going to be here June 28th, and we'll advertise. As soon as you know the location, we'll let you know um, the location for her talk. It'll either be here at Diego's or in Plymouth. It'll be a free talk. Uh, but one of the things that she's pointing out that we talk about in the permaculture course is a plant that is opportunistic, a plant that really can come in and take advantage of a disturbance um, that we look from an invasion biology perspective as being invasive because um, it doesn't have relationships with other elements of this ecosystem. There are other, be other benefits. Um, so like right now, Japanese knotweed is growing and it's at that size where it's incredibly delicious to eat. Mm -hmm. And Japanese knotweed, I would have a very different feel if it was on my property, but... Uh, Japanese knotweed is something that most people really have a hard time with, um, but it it helps in the fight against Lyme disease. It's a tremendous mm -hmm. pollinator plant and has all these other values. So sometimes it's stopping and getting to know an element of the of the environment in a way that we had it before. Can you describe what it's like when you eat Japanese knotweed? Citrusy. I thought it was mucilaginous. <laughs> I wasn't gonna. That's that's not part of selling it, Chris. Yeah, yeah it's kind of a uh, osti. When you, so when, you start, when you start cutting it up and process, processing it, it doesn't have the same structure as like rhubarb. It's kind of like soft and like mucusy. Um, you kind of think, what the hell am I doing? Like I should be eating asparagus and rhubarb. But then you taste it and it's unbelievable. It's really good. I heard a thing I, on the radio. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I heard a thing on the radio. I was talking about the hearty uh, yeah. peas. Yes. Um, down in Lennox, Mass. at Kennedy you State Park. Sam Evans Brown. Yeah, Sam Evans Brown. Brown and this thing, yeah. yeah. It's taken over 20 acres, just knocked the trees down. He said that they're, they're this big around. But it's the only and example there, of it. And they only had one of them, right. Um, for 100 years, it's left unchecked. And this is right. what it did. So I mean, I think mean, you can just cut it back, you know, right. if you have it on your property. You know? But it was amazing. It's out 100 acres because of, you know, cosmopolitan. For what is it? Hardy Kiwi? Hardy Kiwi, yeah. It's the one example mm -hmm. that I know of where it really just totally oh. took over a landscape. Oh. Yeah. You're really getting one. Um, I tried. We have it. We love it. Yeah. Okay. I tried eating some Japanese knotweed, like you suggested, and it just turned into like gooey grossness. How did you prepare it? Tasted, <laughs> it tasted really good. How did you prepare it? In a cast iron, and I put yeah. in like cornmeal and like a bunch of spices. Yeah. And then it, it does get kind of bushy. It tasted delicious, but it, the texture was so gross I couldn't 
<laughs> I'm sorry I got us off track, but it is important to know what you're getting into. Now we're into permaculture confessions. Right. This is going to be part of the book. Yeah, I tried it. It was awful. All right. Another definition of permaculture, one that I really like um, in talking to people, that it's an approach to designing, designing human settlements. Um, and agricultural systems. It's not just about food production. We talk a lot about food production from permaculture. It has a, it's one of the great things it provides us as a framework for thinking about perennial agricultural systems. But thinking about human settlements and all the other components of a settlement modeled on relationships found in, in nature, in a natural ecosystem. Um, and you, as you start looking at definitions, you'll find a definition that probably resonates best with you, and you'll be put on the spot occasionally. It's something that you'll have to practice. Like, how do I, how do I summarize permaculture and hit on the pieces I think are important before they tune out and I've lost them? Um, so it's kind of a moving target. But what's interesting is that at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is create ecosystems. We're trying to design ecosystems. Humans design ecosystems all the time, and they usually are pretty awful. Um, we're trying to do a good job by being informed by the way a natural ecosystem co-evolves. And so we're looking at not just the individual components, you know, the cherry tree or the bio shelter, but how these pieces work together and create a more dynamic system. Um, and a lot of that's just the way that they're positioned and introduced and really thinking through uh, for the context of your site. The other thing that's really cool about permaculture is that it is it's scalable. So Jane, when you asked like how small a site, um, you could do a permaculture not for November, but you could do a permaculture project that's really just the design of the ultimate container garden. Like, maybe that's the only space you have. Like, that's as mu much of an ambitious project you can take on. Um, Eric Tonsmeyer from Massachusetts, who's a great permaculture teacher and a friend, he did a permaculture design for Mexico. Like, the country. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's scalable. It's... It's something that is so steeped in observation and the people involved that it um, it fits the context of where you are. It fits the cultural and the geographic context of where you are. The permaculture framework you're going to learn through this class is the same framework that I teach in Belize, in India, in Africa. We use the same language. We use the same steps. It's just a, it's a linear process that you could pick up anywhere and someone could say, oh, I took a permaculture class and I'm doing design. Oh, and you could find a way to work together. Um, but the results are totally different. So different. Okay. Um, just a couple other points yeah, that I kind of already hit on, but we're going beyond these individual practices, so like natural building, organic gardening, biodynamics, those are all valuable things that can be woven into your design. They can be part of your solutions. Um, High-performance building, uh, renewable energy systems, Ways of organizing social systems, how we organize, new banking systems, new governance systems. Those, those models from different movements are all really important and we want to incorporate them. But we want to incorporate them in ways that they lead to a stronger whole, a stronger system. So the other thing that's interesting about permaculture is you're encouraged to work outside of your topic area, your specialty area. Um, I'm not an architect, but I've designed and built quite a few buildings. And I've done that in collaboration with other people. People who have more of a building focus, um, more of an engineering focus. But we can collaborate. I, I know what the design is calling for. I know what the site is calling for. I know what the limitations may be. And if I lack the ability to figure out how to make it happen, then I collaborate with other people. When permaculture first started to go worldwide, one of the founders, Bill Mollison, um, did a lot of talking at colleges and universities. And he would call out the fact that departments tend to be these individual silos. You know, if you're a biology person, you, you don't talk to the architecture people, who don't talk to the soil scientists, who don't talk to the anthropologists. You know, they're, everyone's in their own silo, which is very much still the case, not only in higher ed, but in other, other realms. And he tried to get people to break out of that mentality you know, that the person working on climate science could actually talk to the person working on community planning or agriculture or whatever. Because of the different backgrounds and the different ways we do the world, that we can come up with more complex solutions. 
And if it's solution oriented, which is the whole idea of permaculture, um, we need to just get with other people and co-create a new possibility. So it involves many hands. It, that threatens a lot of people. Um, so if you're a writer, do I have any right to write things? Probably. I might need some help. Um, but it's getting people comfortable with that. So where did permaculture come from? Um, it started in the 1970s, but it is based on lots of work that came before the 1970s. These are just a couple of books that are here in the library. The library is just down the hall here on the left, just past the bathroom. So if the door's closed, feel free to go in, knock and go in. Um, this is the most complete and amazing permaculture library I've ever seen. Um, and having visited other permaculture sites that have spent a lot of time accumulating texts, this is awesome. Spend time here. If you can come at other times outside of these weekends and just camp out in the library, do it. Um, they like to see people use the books. They just don't like to see you walk away with them. Um, so it's like I'm the honor system, but they're tremendous. And I have yet to find a book that Josh doesn't have. I've tried to gift him a couple books, and he always has them. So these three are actually there. Farmers of 40 Centuries, really looking at how people in Asia lived within their ecosystem, understanding nutrient flow and understanding their component and how they could give back to other species. So a real deep study of that. Um, Smith's Tree Crops, really looking at the first real kind of book looking at uh, perennial agricultural systems, long-term nut crops and, and other things, and thinking about agriculture differently, which has become a uh, major component of permaculture solutions. And then Fukuoka's One Straw Revolution, that the net, part of the natural farming movements kick off. So the two gentlemen that we thank um, for the creation of permaculture as a concept were aware of those works, and, but they came from really different paths. Um, so Bill Mollison, who's on the left for you guys, born in Tasmania, uh, had a really interesting, he probably had more than 27 jobs, Chris, right? So he had a really interesting like life journey before <coughs> permaculture. He's still alive today. Um, if you looked at his resume pre-permaculture, he had been a commercial forester, a commercial fisherman. He was the baker in his village when he was 13, which I always like to note that I have a 13-year-old and a 15-year-old and we would all starve. <laughs> and to get to three in the morning and provision flour. Um, so he had responsibility young. He really shifted. He seemed like he had a two to three year time span where he would learn everything about whatever it was he was doing and get his fill and move on. So in the 1960s, he found himself working through a university system, um, going out into the outback in Australia and doing studies of different species and different populations. So he spent a lot of time alone in a very natural environment studying specific species for the university. And then he would come back into kind of the common culture developed world and see you know, the evolution of strip malls and all these other developments happening in Australia, highway expansions and you know, suburban residential neighborhoods. And he was just pissed. Like he just couldn't believe the utter destruction for this low-cost, um, unfortunate type of development. And so he, he did find his voice in his yelling, and he became quite an activist, railing against kind of thoughtless development and the destruction of some really important natural resources. And so he was protesting a lot of stuff, but he, what he said he realized is he could never provide an answer. He could just point to what was wrong, but he, couldn't, he didn't really know what to tell people, like how to do it differently. So he decided he'd had enough of all of that, and he retreated to his homestead, and basically was like part of a back to the land movement, where he decided, I'm just going to do it right, and get it right on my acreage for me, and like, screw the world, I'm done with them. And he started to work with what he had been thinking about, the early idea of permaculture, but setting up more perennial agricultural systems, thinking about capturing rainwater, providing energy, like meeting some of his needs in a more sustainable way and had a lot of success. And he's not the kind of personality that could uh, not be out sharing his ideas. So he reemerges a couple years later like, hey, I've been doing this, and the, tr the, the trick is solutions. Like we need to show people a different way forward. We need to collaborate and create new solutions. So he got really excited about 
no longer fighting what was going on, but showing a positive way forward. And timing-wise, he meets David Holmgren, who was interested in systems thinking, had an ecology background, was working on a PhD. And so, you know, I can imagine the day they bumped into each other at the water fountain and they start talking, and they, you know, this, this energy started to happen between the two of them. And so they sat down and started to craft this idea of permaculture based in indigenous knowledge and how many people around the world had lived in close proximity to their ecosystem, understanding their ecosystem, living in harmony with their ecosystem. But to start to take additional knowledge that had been gained through other writers and scientists and other over time and start to put this idea out. So they, they write, uh, David's dissertation becomes the emphasis for a, a book. And so Permaculture One comes out, David goes off and practices permaculture. He and his wife buy land and start to document, and the book is here. It's a pretty amazing book where they just document all the aspects from design through implementation of a permaculture design in Australia in the 80s. Bill, who's this amazing storyteller, just decides, I'm going to go teach it. Doesn't know anything really about teaching. Just kind of goes out and starts doing television shows. This is a great series for the Australian Broadcasting Network that you can watch. Um, there are four different ones that he did for half-hour specials. Starts going to other continents and teaching. Uh, the first course, like what you're in, that was done in New Hampshire was down in Dublin. I mean, it was done in the U.S. was in Dublin, New Hampshire, uh, 1981. And Dave Jackie, who's become a, a really well-known permaculture teacher and writer, he was in that class. Uh, a local architect in Meredith, New Hampshire, was in that class. A local realtor who lives in this town was in that class. There were a group of like 20 or 30 people. Um, Bill continued to teach in the 80s, and finally somebody with some teaching experience pulled him aside and said, like, great ideas, but awful delivery. Let's work on this. And so he opened it up for other people to start working on what would a permaculture design course be? What's the curriculum? How do you teach it? His way of teaching was he would start whatever time he showed up that day. He would teach for absolutely as long as he wanted. He would lay down and take little power naps for 20 minutes. And then would stand up and just start talking again. He had no plan. Um, and classes would sometimes go to 1, 2 in the morning. And that's like a lot of information to absorb. So there wasn't a lot of people care going on. Um, so the curriculum continues to evolve. But so does permaculture. I mean, it's, it's an idea that layers keep getting added to. And anyone from this course could take it in a direction that still hasn't gone or evolve it further. When that's one of the most exciting things, like you, you get to, you get to maybe bring it further than it has, and anyone whose work you're inspired by is accessible. The people that you're reading their books or you're seeing their YouTubes or they're coming here to talk, if there's somebody you really want to talk to, we'll connect you with that person. That's what really was amazing to me when I started on my permaculture journey because I was reading a limited amount of, of uh, literature that was available post 2000, and coming to D Acres, but there weren't that many other sites that I knew of or I could visit. So I felt kind of alone. So I just started implementing on my site long before I ever took a course. And then it was just this realization, like Edible Forest Gardens came out and I've been waiting for like eight years for this book to come out. And the fact that I could like call those guys up and talk to them, I could go see them, have them come here and teach. People are accessible. Okay, questions so far? All right, so one of the things that Bill and David gave us that we still use is this idea of three core ethics. And a lot of different sustainability frameworks um, have core ethics. So the three that we have here, earth care, people care, and fair share, in their simplest forms, um, earth care is obviously we want to be good stewards of the natural systems that we live within. Um, and that we have an impact on while we're here on the planet. But Earth Care goes even further to say we also need to be thinking about restoration and regeneration. That it's not enough to just reduce our negative impact, we have to increase our positive impact, and we have to restore damage that's been done maybe by others. People care. We obviously want to think, we want to take good care of each other as part of this course, and take care of our families and our friends. But we need to think about how our choices impact other people. 
um, how our purchasing choices impact other people we may never meet, how our choices today, uh, consumption-wise, may impact future generations. Chris will take us down this dark wormhole tomorrow. Um, but this idea that we want to be, and I think Josh really summed it up nicely in his introduction this morning, that we want to be creating a different reality on the planet and for future generations, and, and people we may not meet. Um, so what's nice about permaculture is although we're working on ecosystem design and solutions, there's a heavy emphasis on people, um, which is wonderful. And then fair share is also referred to as share the surplus. And the idea being that we need to decide how much it is we're going to take. You know, if you picture all the world's resources on a table, it's a buffet, and we're all in line. You know, what do you take from that buffet, knowing that there'll be other people in line after you, maybe decades later? Fair share also talks about what are you going to give back. So what are you going to contribute to that buffet? Um, uh, what time are you going to give or expertise are you going to give you know, to the movement and to your community? Um, it might be money, it might be time, it might be talent. Like There's a lot of ways we give back, but sharing the surplus um, is really a, a critical part of these ethics. Question. The ethics are not enough alone. Uh, they're really helpful, and when you're going through a design process or if you're looking at a design, um, feel free to ask questions about that because it should be pretty obvious when you do a design presentation that you're reflecting the ethics. If you're doing beautiful things to the ecosystem and you're being pretty awful to the people around, it'll be obvious. Um, but because they're not enough, uh, Bill Mollison and David came up with a series of principles. And the original set of principles as crafted by Bill Mollison is like, it's like 35 principles, I think. Some of them are some of the most inspirational phrases I've ever read. There's a lot of redundancy in that list, like, well, isn't number 17 a lot like number 28? Um, and it's just so long. I, I think halfway through, I start thinking about like my grocery list or something else. So 35 is a lot of principles to remember. David recognized that, and he wrote a book, I think it was in the late 1990s, uh, called Principles and Pathways to Permaculture which is a pretty academic look. Yeah, it is. Um, it's a great book. It's just a really academic look, like one of the first early academic looks at permaculture where he took each of the principles as he articulated them, and he narrowed it to 12. And he explores each one in a chapter. Have you already gone through the book? Yeah. Yeah. What do you think of it? Um, uh, yeah, he, he explains what each one is pretty well. It's nutrient dense. Yeah. It's like one of the ones I go back to occasionally, like, I think I need to read Principle 7 a little deeper. And he provides a lot of examples, as I'll try to do today. I'll give you guys some examples of them. Um, along with that book, a later um, resource that he provided is his permaculture website, which is based in um, Australia, is all open source. So he has, you can look at the eth ethics and principles. Some of the images I use today, like that image of Epics, comes from his website. He just makes it all available. And for each of the principles, you can go deeper into different examples. We're going to say, here's an example of observe and interact, and how the picture and how the description. So it's really nice if you, if you want to acquaint yourself with these principles. Um, he's invested a lot of time to provide that for free to support the, the permaculture work happening around the world. So the 12 principles really help us think more deeply about our design, about the problem we might be facing. Um, there's a great Bill Mollison um, line that the problem is the solution, which is wonderful. Like this really thoughtful way to look at everything. The problem is the solution. Um, it can be frustrating. It could be a whole chapter of your book. It could be like, sometimes a problem just is a problem. And it's like <laughs> frighteningly <laughs> maddening. Um, but after, if you give it time, I have found every single time that the solution is embedded there. Um, it's amazing. And I'll show us a couple of examples. So with these principles, we can use these to understand how to approach a design. We can use these in um, creation of solutions. But every, not everything that you're going to design as a solution is going to have all 12. Right? It might have one. 
they might have a couple. Um, it's better if there are a couple of things reflected, and that kind of happens more organically than you really have to try. But it's something we're kind of looking for. It's also just kind of a nice checklist to use, like, well, how is this design catching and storing energy? How am I obtaining a yield? Like, am I going to get food, or am I going to get um, spiritual, personal well-being out of this? So I'm going to continue to participate in the system, or my family might feel engaged. You know, that kind of thing. So that book can help if, you need, if any of these are hard um, to grasp. I'm going to share some examples. And these are not intended to be the ultimate examples. These are examples that resonate well with me. Um, so they're just one person's expression of what some of these are. And I encourage you to think about things that come to mind for you. Because um, there's an infinite number of ways to look at each of these. All right, so observation interaction. I'm going to, I keep saying I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this at some point. You're going to hold me to it. So I'm going to do an update of this slideshow with pictures of my kids now. Because they're not that oh old. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> is that your house? That's my house. Yeah, no, you've been there, right? Whoa. Yeah. It's so different now, huh? Yeah. I, I want to, if anyone has one of those sandboxes, I want to put two teenage men in it <laughs> and take a picture. Because now they'd be like yeah. right in front of an asparagus patch next to a greenhouse. <laughs> like. But this, this is observation and interaction. This is... Um, we moved into Plymouth, New Hampshire intentionally. My wife and I moved up to New Hampshire from southern New England because we didn't like the common culture that dominated the landscape of, of Rhode Island, where we were from. It just never really resonated with us. I couldn't articulate it, but it really bothered me. And I loved being up here. I loved the pace of life. I loved access to the outdoors. It's just the type of place I felt I wanted to raise a family. And um, I just had to trust my intuition. And a lot of this is intuition. I mean, we can't teach you intuition, but trust it. Um, so we, long story short, we end up buying a home in Plymouth after living in other communities. And we intentionally moved in town to a half acre site from a much larger rural property that we had owned. And the idea was we were going to be able to walk everywhere. Uh, I was going to be more involved in the university and our kids were going to have access to stuff in a real town that we did because we grew up in the suburban Neighborhoods where you know you had to get in the minivan and be driven everywhere, and you had canned vegetables, and you know it was modern life, um, and that just wasn't necessarily what we wanted. So we moved onto this site. We didn't know this building, this 1890s house or this half acre at all. So we decided I really wanted to follow print the principles of permaculture from the very beginning, and have a logical progression through understanding the site and actually making it fit our lifestyle. And I wanted to have a permaculture project because I didn't know of any permaculture projects. I didn't know about the acres yet. Um, and so we started with observation and interaction. We had just renovated the house. And so observation and interaction meant like Steve didn't have to do anything for like a year. Just like looked around, let stuff grow, talked to neighbors about the house and how it was part of a much bigger property over time. We moved there with a child who was an infant, just a few months old. And be observation and interaction that we had a lot of free time, so we ended up with another child. Um, so then there were four of us on this property, and the goals shifted a little bit. And over time, what we decided was that we didn't like lawn. Um, we had access to great soils. We wanted to produce more of our own food, so we started to sheet mulch and produce annual gardens. And then over time, that evolved into thinking about perennial beds, and perennial food systems and season extension, and the project started to take form. Like the, we started to understand the one sunny spot that can support a greenhouse. And the fact that I would like to come back from skiing in January and go in the greenhouse, which is 75 degrees, and take my shoes off and pick lettuce greens. Um, and so, like, our goals got tuned into our site and what we wanted to invest personally into the site over time. So, but observation was huge. We didn't know right away that this was a dry spot with great sunlight for a greenhouse, or that was a good spot for stormwater mitigation or habitat that just wanted to emerge in this spot if you didn't hit it with a mower every seven days. So it's just a little bit of thinking about observation and interaction to drive your design. The second principle is catching and storing energy. Now, you'll notice David Holmgren gives us these great little icons in the sunshine with the bottle. Um, there are lots of ways we can catch and store energy. 
you could think about it most simply in thinking about renewable energy. I'm going to collect energy in a solar panel during the day, and then I'm going to use that to power my computer so I can earn some money, so I can continue this permaculture odyssey. Um, this is from a permaculture site in southeast India, uh, Sagan Forest. You could think about capturing and storing energy in a really small microclimate. Um, this is just a real simple cold frame made of locally milled wood and some windows from the dump. And this is Christmas Eve, I don't know, eight, nine years ago probably. Um, but creating a spot where I could capture the sun's energy through those storm windows during the day and just create an environment that would support lettuce greens in New Hampshire in December. How long do you keep harvesting them? That when we had cold frames, we ended up up to like four cold frames before we built the greenhouse. And usually by the beginning of January, it was diminishing returns. Yeah. But you, usually into December was easy in a cold frame. And then you could also start some stuff early, which was nice. Does the greenhouse do better than that? It does a couple things better. It's an easier work environment. You're not like this, you know, down, yeah, like yeah. doing stuff. So I can actually stand and long term, I think it's better for me. Um, it lasts a little bit longer. We grow greens till the beginning of February. So we're getting a little bit longer season. And then we're starting stuff at the beginning of March. We usually take February off. But you could go this year, you could easily go on 12 months. Um, and you don't have to shovel off the greenhouse. But these things, like some of the years where we got a significant amount of snow, I spent most of my time shoveling cold frames and trying not to create a shadow from the snow mound. So like snow management, I became really obsessed with where my piles of snow were. And I don't worry about that with the greenhouse. It's tall enough that it's not an issue. Catching and storing energy can be food. This is our, I don't know, he was probably 11 or 12, Ethan at the time. He's picking um, Nanking cherries. So capturing the sun's energy, the energy of the land from the soil, and creating a food crop that you can eat fresh off the bush, or you can create jams, jellies, alcohols, other things with. Um, there are a lot of ways we can think about capturing and storing energy, preserving the harvest through the season. That's capturing and storing energy. So the third principle, obtain a yield. Do you mind keeping an eye on the time for me? If I just start giving me the sign, I can start getting along with I have no time to be given up. It's a lot of All right, cool. Some of these I want to like, tell you the whole story, and I just can't. In fairness to you, you all starve. So we need to be getting something out of the system. Maybe. Some of the work that you do, you might not get a lot out. Um, or it might not be apparent to people what you're getting out. I showed that thatched roof structure, Sadhana Forest um, in India, Kenya, and Haiti. It's a reforestation project. You would think the yield is a forest, right? It would be <laughs> obvious it's a reforestation project. It's a their tagline is to forest that grows people. They want that personal transformation that you have by caring for a tree, planting a tree, being part of restoring an ecosystem. The forest is secondary. If the trees survive, that's wonderful, but they really are trying to enable people to take control and be part of a positive force on the planet. That's a yield. Um, when I first started not coming from a gardening background or a sustainability background as a kid, um, when I started experimenting with things like trying to scale up our garlic production on our, on our own site, um, the first year I can remember garlic scapes and saying, like, what a pain, you have to go around and cut these things? You know, you know all the wonderful things you can do with garlic scapes. You can make pestos and do all stir fries and all this. So here's a plant where you plant it in the fall. You get this amazing flower that you can cut and is edible. Um, you get the beauty of it. It just I couldn't believe how many yields I was getting out from this one bulb that I was putting in. Um, and so I f feel that with time, as you get accustomed to permaculture and you get accustomed to your own site and your own design you will discover so many yields. Um, the personal knowledge, the spiritual well-being from being outside, uh, the amusement, uh, the sharing with other people, the food, like it's on and on. In, in a permaculture design, we say you should try to strive for as many functions or as many yields as possible from everything you're investing time in. So we talk about stacking functions and say it should be at least three functions. 
Like if you're going to put up solar panels and it's only going to give you electricity and nothing else, think about it a little bit longer. See how you can get other functions out of it. Um, and it becomes kind of like the permaculture challenge. Like how many functions can I squeeze out of this? Does anyone know what that is? Except rice. 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 Yeah. So when I think about rice, we have three rice paddies on the property. And I think about yields from rice. We get rice. We get a habitat that attracts damselflies and dragonflies and other frogs and other things. We get a tremendous amount of knowledge about which, which rice varieties from the planet will work well in Plymouth, New Hampshire. We freak out people who can't believe you can grow rice in Plymouth, <laughs> New Hampshire. Um, it's gorgeous when it gets tall and the panicles of rice, the rice heads are out there swaying in the breeze. Um, it's a great place, as I found out, for hide and seek. When the patty isn't wet, the kids would get like <laughs> in between the rice, which and it also like gave my dad flashbacks from Vietnam, first time he saw we were growing rice. Like there are a lot of things that it stirs up for people, and then it turns into yields. Um, Stormwater capacity on our site really improves our ability to capture and store water on site and let it slowly seep into the ground or be taken up in the atmosphere. So yields are interesting. Can anyone name this flower? The honeysuckle? No, it's elderberry. Okay. And so elderberry is a plant that we have nearby in the forested floodplains. Uh, it's a plant that we harvest for, cap talk about capturing and storing energy, we make a tincture that we use for our own health through the winter. Um, so we're getting medicine out of it. It's a tremendous pollinator plant. It's great for specific species that you want to attract to your site. It's gorgeous. It's easy to grow. Like the yields go on and on. It's native. It's good blueberry. I mean, it's good blueberry pancakes. Yes. Crunchy. Not a lot. Um, this is a project that Josh mentioned earlier that he was the brainchild of Local Foods Plymouth. It's our online extension to our farmer's market. Um, and thinking about yields, when Josh first came up with the idea and pitched it to a few people, and then D Acres created the website. My, I saw this, I was like, wow, this is great. I'm going to get involved with this because it's going to be easier for Steve to get food. Like, Steve can go online and order food once a week. It's going to be convenient. I can pay using PayPal. I can go down, or my wife can go down and pick up the food. And those are the yields, like easy access to local food. What's interesting is it have, was heavily dependent on volunteer labor. It still is. Um, and so yields were meeting other people getting to know people who were providing the food, that were growing the food, creating value-added products, learning about their process, learning about new products that I had never used in cooking. Um, the yields went on and on. It's pretty, pretty phenomenal. Okay, number four, applying self-regulation and accepting feedback and thinking about not only uh, the planet as an organism, as a self-regulating organism, but how do we accept um, feedback. These are two ecosystems, man-made ecosystems. The one on the upper left hand uh, would be rainforest removal in South America. And the one on the lower right is mountaintop removal for coal or any number of other things, but this is in this case coal. Um, as far as accepting feedback, these are ecosystems I have helped create. It's not something that makes me feel good to know that I've helped with deforestation or mountaintop removal or any number of other impacts. But I need to know that some of my decision making has resulted in that. And that's not something I want to continue to do. So constantly reevaluating what I'm doing and trying to be honest with myself and make, continue to evolve, continue to make ch better changes in my own practices. When we moved into town, now I need to find, I actually know where this bike trailer is, I should try to get them both into the bike trailer. Um, when we moved into town, the intent was to reduce our transportation footprint. And like the first six months, we were such liars. Like we were like high five each other, like, yeah, we live in town, but we were driving everywhere. <laughs> and so I had to accept that feedback, like what do I need to change about my pattern? I had to buy this bike trailer and just make a commitment to leave a few minutes earlier to bike the kids to school, to go downtown and pick up stuff um, with the bike trailer, picked up pizzas for birthday parties, I've moved stuff from Agway with the bike trailer because you can lay it flat, create a little flat bed. Like, it just took a little bit of effort. And we always had a good time. Like, we still, they're too big for it now. They 
know that they're expected to walk and bike when they can in town, and we always had a good time. We never got back from biking together and said, like, well, that was awful. We had a good time. And we reduced our footprint, and it led to other changes, made other changes that had seemed really big, not seem so difficult. The fifth principle, using and valuing renewable resources and services. Um, in the book, David Holmgren talks about the value of trees as one example. And it's a beautiful section of the book where he talks about all the ecological services a tree provides. Um, and so this tree is standing there and it's part of cleaning the air and making sure that we have something we can breathe. It's you know, shading the ground, it's absorbing water, it's providing habitat. Um, it goes on and on. And at the end of its life, it may fall over and decompose in place and become part of the forest soil. It might be harvested to keep you warm or to create building materials for your house. Uh, but on that hillside in Tamworth, New Hampshire, every one of those trees is providing this amazing number of, of ecological services without ever being asked to do so. And so sometimes we have to know when to just leave something alone. That you know, you don't have to create a permaculture design that impacts all aspects of your property. Um, later in the course, we'll talk about the zones of use on a property, and there is a zone of use that's referred to as forever wild. So there might be parts of your property that are forever wild that you recognize for a variety of reasons are better off left alone. Unless there's a hard key there. Yeah, you <laughs> might yeah, deal with that. My uh, property butts the uh, the Robert Frost place. Oh, it does. So. Probably not going to, you know, whose woods are these? <laughs> well, they're mine, Bob, but I'm going to leave them alone. <laughs> <laughs> so in looking at renewable resources and services, you can think about how can I use a renewable resource to meet my own needs. So I just think this is great coming from like New England. So this is um, a structure in Africa, northern Tanzania, that was created by a permaculture student of mine. It's, uh, it's actually a resort where they made all, it's all natural building modeled after a uh, traditional Maasai dwelling, which is the Maasai people live in there. And this is the only solar hot water facility in the region. Uh, but this is a guest accommodation. And so they wanted a way to meet a guest expectation that after getting dirty out doing something on a safari or whatever, that they'd be able to take a hot shower. And so how do you do that in a place where you don't have electricity and you don't have all these other expectations from somebody coming from the U.S. or Europe. So they built these solar hot water heaters to use the fact that the sun was up um, to make, make that connection. Um, using animals within food systems. So this chicken tractor, using the fact that the chicken with access to the earth below and with some protection from predators or some control over taking over the whole garden will provide certain services. We used chicken tractor for many years on our property as we converted lawn to garden. The sixth principle, produce no waste. Um, it's a tall order. But in thinking about waste, you're probably all pretty comfortable with the idea of, you know, avoiding packaging, avoiding bringing waste into your household, or if you have it, responsibly recycling materials and reusing them as many times as you can, or even backyard composting of your food waste and, you know, lawn clippings and things like that. But consider all the other ways that you can reduce waste or uh, redirect waste. So in our design, we, when we did our permaculture design, we looked at the house. We have, and you'll come and see this, but it's a little less than 1,300 square feet. And I knew that I wanted to disconnect some of our waste stream from the sewage system. That I wanted to keep those nutrients on site. We were being really careful about the food we were ingesting. And I had all this great organic material I was then sending away to become a problem for somebody else. And it was a high energy um, way to dispose of it. And so we built a composting toilet. It's not for everybody. Um, you get to use the composting toilets here, and Josh will show you the system here. And it's one of my favorite lunchtime and dinnertime topics. So if you want, you know, call me over to your table. We'll talk composting toilets. Um, but this was part of our journey. It was one of the ways we were going to reduce how much waste um, we put out to the world and use it in a positive way. You can also see the waste stream as a resource. Um, you'll see some strategic waste piles here, resource piles. I think he has a sign up label on them. This is not, sometimes I see people that get really excited in the presentation, like, ooh, I can just continue to accumulate things. 
well, this isn't like an open invitation to like hoard materials. Um, you have to decide what's a reasonable amount. But in our case, we wanted to create a hardscape for our family behind our house because it's in town. It's a pretty public property. We wanted a place we could retreat to and have dinner, just the four of us or whatever, with friends. And hardscape is expensive, has lots of other environmental impacts, and so we used urbanite. Urbanite is just cement. It's four-inch pad that was somebody's garage pad, and it was being broken up to be landfill. And we saw that what was somebody's waste as an opportunity to create something that met a need on our property. Um, cardboard. There's a lot of cardboard used in sheet mulching and other techniques that you'll see in permaculture systems. And that's a waste stream. You know, if I go to the bike shop, as I do, and pick up their Thursday cardboard before they go to the transfer station, they're pretty happy. I just save them a trip. I've got cardboard that I'm taking responsibility for, and I'm suppressing weeds and other things to change the dynamic of the ecosystem. The seventh principle, designing from patterns to details. Um, this is crystal waters. This is where I did my official formal permaculture certification. And what's interesting to me is this is a site that's about 200 acres, equivalent to 200 acres. And it was a really damaged property. It had been a horse, um, primarily a horse farm. Um, people would board their horses there and they lived further away in Brisbane and other places. And it had just been really mismanaged. And the ecosystem had been incredibly beaten down. A lot of erosion, a lot of pesticide use. Um, when the founders of the Crystal Waters Eco Village bought the property and they started thinking about how to design this, to hold um, space for 75 households, they looked at the bioregion. So they stepped back and looked at a huge area of Eastern Australia from the Glasshouse Mountains to the ocean. They thought about um, how Aboriginal people moved across the property and across that region. They thought about weather patterns. They thought about a lot of things way beyond the property boundaries. And slowly they came in to look at the watershed that they were in the sub-watersheds of their property, they really took a systems view. And with that understanding, then they started to figure out where in the property was most appropriate for development and for these homes and how to cluster the homes in a way that worked for the social piece um, and where they should leave for a while. And that's not the way we usually do development. You know, CVS does not come to a town and say, we've looked at the bioregion, <laughs> and what we've decided is best. Um, it's just not the approach we take. Um, and so this is kind of an extreme version of it, but we want to look at the bigger picture and then design down. And the, the details of the design become much easier when we've looked out first. You can do the same thing for the systems that you'll see here. This is a forest garden um, in its third year at our place. And what we did was we looked at other forest ecosystems. We looked at the, the way a forest stacks um, height and partitions resources. Different plants get different access to uh, rainfall or sunlight or resources in the soil. We looked at what other people had created through permaculture texts where they had studied these ecosystems. And then we used that pattern to select a pattern that worked for us. This is a pattern that looks more like a successional forest, like it's called old field mosaic in Edible Forest Gardens, where you have an old field that's no longer being mowed, and you have small trees and shrubs that are starting to pop up. And so you're not going to get 45 to 75 foot tall mature trees. This is at the southern end of our property. We didn't want tall trees. So we knew we had a height limitation. We knew we had a depth limitation. We knew we wanted medicinals and edible plants. We knew we wanted to attract other species to the site. And a lot of that helped us figure out the pattern and then the details. Then we knew elderberry was a choice and other things were choices. Same idea, pattern to details. My first trip to Tanzania to teach a course for an Australian uh, nonprofit called Food Water Shelter, the students show up to class the first day, 35 students from all over Eastern Africa, and consensus was they wanted to learn about food forest. We want to know about food forest. We know about Dave Jackie, this guy from New Hampshire. Um, we want to learn about food forest. What can you teach us about food forest? I was like, really surprised by this. I'm like, pretty sure that. There's a history of food forests here on Mount Miru 
And so I had somebody actually take me out who knew a little bit about that. And we were driving down the road, and I said, what's going on there? And they said, oh, that's someone's like food, uh, garden forest. I'm like, all right, so we stopped, and we picked up. There were like nine different species. There was a timber species. There was a firewood species. There were you know, bananas and citrus and all this stuff. So I started taking pictures. And I went back, and I'm like, you guys know more about food forest than I do. Like, let's go out and talk to people who are doing this. So we ended up finding a gentleman in the village who actually took us through his site. He was growing vanilla. He was doing all these amazing things. Um, so these patterns that we're looking to create, these solutions we're looking to create around the world, just recognize there are other people at the same time kind of co-creating the same reality. All right, number eight, integrating rather than segregating. The idea that relationships between elements um, lead to a, a greater good. So on the lower right-hand corner, that's actually the site plan for um, Crystal Waters. And the upper left-hand corner is a place called New Benusa in Peterborough. Is anyone familiar with New Benusa? It's co-housing development. Yeah, it's an interesting place. It's in West Peterborough, New Hampshire. Um, co-housing is similar in a lot of ways. A lot of co-housing developments are similar to eco-villages. And the idea that a group of people come together and decide they want to create a different reality for how they're going to live together. Um, in both of these cases, they looked the inhabitants looked at how they could integrate their needs, how they could share resources. Um, New Venusa is centered around an organic community-supported agriculture operation and a large forestry operation. Um, Crystal Waters is focused around agriculture, um, habitat regeneration, like really bringing ecosystems back. And, and then in both cases they share barns and bakeries and tools and vehicles and like different aspects of kind of integrating with the greater good. So that in some cases people get to work less or have you know more capital for other things. We can take this down to like the smallest level and think about how we integrate instead of separating out uses. So this is a solar panel that's also bicycle storage in the UK. It's in a, a really um, excellent location as far as um, solar access, but it's also in a location where they wanted to encourage more bicycle use. And this is an example where they, um, in Australia, where they took one parking space out of circulation and they created the infrastructure to encourage people to walk and bike into town. So this little building kind of serves as a, a self um, supported kiosk. It has a, a shower facility inside, a little locker room where you can put your sweaty biking clothes and like change it to your work clothes. Um, the little vegetated area outside is a gray water swale that's treating the, the shower water. It's got solar hot water and solar electric on top for like security lights and the hot water for the shower. They really try to think about how can we integrate a system here that will lead to a, a change in um, behavior. And you can always strive to find new functions and new ways of integrating. When we built our greenhouse structure, I started to look at the whole east side of it and think like, wow, this is a great vertical growing opportunity. And after a couple of years of watching it and saying like, in the summertime, we get way more morning sun than we need into this space, which leads to it heating up faster than it really should. Um, let's grow hops there. So this is hops. In forest gardens, um, by integrating all of these different components and changing from what was just a lawn, kind of monoculture suburban lawn, into this really complex soil that's full of um, fungi, we ended up with this additional yield. The integration led to this idea of mushrooms as an additional yield from a system that we hadn't planned on. So they're actually as big as it appears on that. <laughs> garden, the garden giant is giant. All right, number nine, using small and slow solutions. One of the things I know I fell victim to early on was as I started to read about permaculture and like find stuff online, I felt I had to do all of it that day. Um, and that part of it's my... My personality, and you are affected with some of the same. I don't know what you're talking about. You just planted <laughs> 250 trees. But um, you don't have to do it all the same. You don't have to do it all at the same time. You can phase it. You can phase it based on availability of time and resources and other things. And by using small and slow solutions, you get to get feedback from the systems. 
if you've just made changes to something, like watch how it works before you do that all across the property. And so you're encouraged to think about small and slow solutions and in thinking about your design, not to think you have to implement the whole design the next day. Um, and small and slow solutions could be ways that you meet your own needs um, in a different way. So we did this solar oven fundraiser in town probably 10 years ago, and we got the sun oven, and that was a nice shift in thinking about how on a sunny day in any season, we could meet our needs for maybe cooked food, if that was the desire, um, by taking good use of renewable resource. So in this case, there are multiple permaculture principles embedded in this one solution, this one appliance that never gets plugged in. Kiwi. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Kiwi, when we established the Kiwi in our site, which we established in the middle of the site where we could control it, and you know, I could decide if I were to leave this property at some point if I want to just make sure. and um, embracing the, the marginal aspects. So his site, he talks about in some of his videos, um, was hillside, New England site, pretty drought ridden because of its compacted soils and its slope. And what he did over time to address that and other goals he had for the site was create this environment that is a combination of terrestrial and aquatic systems with all kinds of edge between all kinds of different ecosystems, open field and forest. Um, water and wetlands and upland. And each of these places, you have a greater diversity of species. Because you have the species that like both separate systems meeting in the middle. And you have species that like um, individual systems. And so we can create this. In our gardens, we can create more edge, which creates more space for spiders and 
predatory insects and insects that like shade and cool places to live, insects that like to be out in the sun. Um, yeah, so we want to think about that. It also leads to much more interesting designs. And what you'll see in how permaculture gets implemented, you can also bring your own style to it. D acres is a really natural way of doing things. And garden clubs show up here all the time, sometimes unannounced, and everyone gets out of the van, and they're like, ah, oh, it's not untidy. Like, <laughs> Josh is a re he's developed a very nice way of like explaining to people what the goals are here and how they might be different if it's your one quarter acre lot, or if it's a school, or something else, where there might be other goals that also need to be balanced. So we can use edge, um, and we can get really crazy with it, which is fun. I like doing that. Or we can keep it much more under control and still have a lot of ecological value. All right, the last principle, creatively using and responding to change. Um, this is kind of the problem is the solution principle. And things are going to change. Things are changing in the world. Things are changing in your lives. Things are going to change in your designs. Um, and we can work with that. We can work with that knowing it from the beginning, or we can react to it. This is a pretty popular uh, diagram of what a food forest can be. And when you, if you set up a perennial agriculture system, you realize pretty early on that if you're going to plant trees far apart from each other, considering their mature size, you end up with a lot of space in between. Um, so if you're going to have some really tall hardwoods, they're going to be really far from each other, and you can have this large sheet mulched area in between. Well, you can creatively use that space for a number of years to grow annuals, to build the soil, to slowly introduce other perennials. Like you can use and respond to that change. You can plan from the beginning. Or, like on a small urban site, in some cases I've squeezed stuff together, and I know I need to participate in managing the size of those plants every year. So you can take either approach. This is change. This is changing about how we react um, to each other and how we relate to our built environment. So in, urban in the urban permaculture movement, um, there's something called tactical urbanism. And we'll talk about it probably in October. But tactical urbanism is a way of changing the dynamic of our urban environments. And so this is what's called um, parking to park let. And there are some permaculture folks that are now contracted with the city of Cambridge, and they're doing a whole bunch of these conversions. Initially, they may start like this, really informally. You just stop parking cars in a couple of spots. You throw some, in this case, throw some mulch down, put out some temporary furniture and some planters, and it's across from a coffee shop, and people start hanging out. Um, in Montreal, they've done it really formally. They have these systems that can be picked up with a forklift and taken away for the winter and then brought back out in the summer when you actually want to be outside. Um, but this is creatively using and respond to change. This is like testing the concept to see if, see if people actually use it before we invest in the change. Okay. I'm thinking about just the first look that we take at ethics and principles, um, Bill Mollison wrote this and talked about, you know, his his view of permaculture and thinking that this was his vision, that we're only truly secure when we can look out our kitchen window and see our food growing and our friends working nearby. And I think over the next seven months, you can add whatever series of goals are your goals to that. You can create that bold vision of the future. And it was awesome to hear from all of you going around this morning in your introductions, the elements of vision that you already have for your site or your future community. Um, and so we'll encourage you to think as boldly as possible about that future vision. And to really, we're going to also encourage you to really dig into the details. And so when you say, you know, I want to look out the window and I want apples. Well, do you really want apples? Or do you want edible fruit, you know, every month of the growing season? Like, let's really get down to it. Is it really apple? You just really love apples and you absolutely want apples? Um, and so we're trying to help you through the curriculum think about what it is you want, what you want to contribute. Um, this will bring up a lot of complex ideas. Of what it's to, we've seen some career shifts um, and lots of other really interesting things as far as how this plays out. Okay. That's all I had for you this morning, but I'd like to open it up just to any discussion or dialogue. 
at the beginning, before you started building on uh, all these gardens and yeah. greenhouse and all that, did you have a plan designed out? And are you following that, or has it changed a lot over time? I have followed, I did start to create one about two years in, and I didn't even know quite how to do it. Um, and so what I did was I kind of sketched out the property, and I basically did what you're going to learn. It's called analysis and assessment. And so I looked at all the spots that were low and wet, and the spots that were, you know, producing certain kinds of vegetation, spots that were sunny, you know, through the growing season, like really trying to identify all these areas. And that you're going to actually do it in separate layers, so you have, you'll have a deeper understanding. But I looked at, like, where do I have overlying power lines? in a place I've been thinking about a really big tree. Like, that doesn't work. And then through that, we figured out um, roughly, like kind of like bubble diagram, real loose. Like, in the front yard, we want it to be a, po a pollinator calendar that goes from frost to frost, the earliest flowers we can to the latest flowers we can. We want it to be low, so we can sit on the front porch and we can look out across all of these pollinators and all these flowers, and we can still see our neighbors when they walk by. But we want it to produce medicine, for the house, we want to produce food, we wanted to um, decompact the soil. Like we had goals and we had rough ideas, but I couldn't have told you which plants at that time. And so then as the time or resources come up and we can look at that area, I have gone in and done a whole new design process to really what we call patch design. To say, okay, in this area, what do I need to do with the soil? What can I do to keep stormwater on site? Or in our case, we brought a lot of stormwater from the street into our site. Um, and as a result, what plants do we want to use? How do we phase it? Do we do all the plants the first year, or we start with a couple of ground covers and a couple of fruit trees and then add over time, which has typically been our approach. Yeah. Um, so the design process continues. Plus, you, cont you continue to visit other sites and be exposed to other mm -hmm. solutions. And sometimes it really clicks with, oh, that is the solution to my problem or, or my desire. Um, and I need to move some stuff around. But what we've avoided doing, which has been great, is having to go back and like rip stuff out or redo it. We've put trees in the right spots. Like the, that process has been helpful. One of the things that I found that was helpful about my design is that once I had it in place and I began to implement it, when new opportunities for design came in, I knew my site so well, but I also had the thought processes and pattern of thought. So. It, would have been formalized in my mind that I didn't write it down anymore. I got to like create it in my head and do it because I'd already eliminated 97% of the options because I'd already gone through By going through the design process, we internalize those 12 principles. You know your site so well. Um, like we just discovered that we had 6,000 square feet of land because we actually had it surveyed properly. And so, but I knew my neighbor's property well enough to just walk in and throw down a hundred plants without writing out the formal design anymore. So. The other thing that's amazing, like you think about the evolution, like when we started on our site, we were converting lawn to garden. And we had chickens and we were doing things that were unusual. People would stop by and be like, what are you, what are you got going on over here? And um, you never know how that will impact other people. We didn't go out and like, you know, preach the good word on the corner in Plymouth. But now there are two other properties on our street. Um, one, we're going through a pretty substantial permaculture design, a ton of earthwork that they've done. Um, and it's really the, the connectivity between the parcels, thinking from like a, for other species, for birds and mm -hmm. insects and stuff, is pretty amazing, this corridor that's getting built down to the floodplain. I never dreamed of that. I mean, that's other people co-creating this new possibility. Yeah, it's awesome. You mentioned that if you move away, you'll pull out the kiwi. Yeah, you said it would be a <laughs> and possibility. So my question is, and is will if the designer leaves, will it collapse? That will be no, no. turn into cattails. No, that's a really good question. You know, because it's like I put a swimming pool in, now my neighbor's going to put a swimming pool in, and now you know it yeah. spreads, and but then. Nobody wants to buy a house with a swimming pool anymore. You know, like, are you doing something here that is no, going to I be a so. hazard to other owners who aren't going to be able to handle it? I don't believe so. Okay. So two things. One, when we put the kiwi in, we did it in that location, because the only other kiwis I'd ever seen were here. And Josh had planted them in the late 1990s, 2000. So he was a few years ahead of ours, but I really didn't know much about them. And so I planted them in a place where I could really observe them 
and I would walk past them up to my office. Um, and with the thought that if I ever, because I didn't know that I'd even still be on the property now. So if I thought, if these things really do kind of get out of control and I'm at all worried about it, I can, on the way out, I can yank them out of the ground. I don't think I would do that. There are a lot more hardy kiwis around, as I've discovered, that haven't had problems, that mm-hmm. haven't taken over the way the ones in Massachusetts did on that site. Um, and we have, in New Hampshire, a team of real estate agents that are permaculture real estate agents. They're now a team of four. Okay. They've had to grow from a husband and part-time wife team to yeah. four full-time people. Uh, she was a part-time employee. She was full-time yeah. wife. But, um, <laughs> so now, if in a couple of years... So much. A couple of years ago, before their practice really took off and really was helping like our kind of, of uh, people, for a bunch of people find properties where people had done the type of things we'd be interested in, but also sell properties. My kids put our property on the market on April Fool's as a joke to my wife. Um, <laughs> and so it was on Facebook, and it was crazy, like the sensation of like, wow, that property's for sale. Um, so I think it would attract a like-minded person that would want to understand what we did there and maybe do things differently. Um, but I, th- I think there's hope for the kids. <laughs> yeah, I feel if I if I walked off our property today, I, it's been such a, a wonderful journey. I've learned so much, not from the things I've done to the property, but the, the way the ecosystem has reacted to that and the species it has introduced. And like. I feel like the soil is healthier. We have more species. We have no species on our site. I mean, mm-hmm. it was that blank lawn. Like not even a squirrel. And so the depth of species on the site, um, if somebody were to erase all that, I feel the good that was done for that 15-year window was worth it. And it often happens that it gets erased. I see that. It might. I'm With not going to be the last gardens. person. Yeah, I'm not going to be the last person to renovate a house from 1890. I mean, I've seen the generations of... <laughs> of changes to that structure. Yeah. And I tried to do things that, at the end of their lives, it's non-toxic, it's local, it can be composted, it can be reused, it's not going to leave a legacy of, of damage. Uh, somebody, it might be me, it might be one of my kids, it might be one of you, somebody's going to do something for that place. 